We've seen many nations move towards small-bore high-velocity revolvers in the lead-up to the Great War. But not everyone agreed, and sometimes big and slow still won the race. Hi, I'm Ovias, and this, well this is the pistol Colt 455 inch with 5 and 1 half inch barrel Mark 1, a British contract Colt News Service. Let's go get a look at the light box. Weighing in at 2 and 1 half pounds and with an overall length of 10.8 inches, this is a hefty wheel gun. The swing out cylinder will simultaneously eject or individually load 6. 455 Mark II cartridges. First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, this episode builds on several previous, and for the sake of time, I'm going to have to keep the early history fairly light. For now, we'll assume that you know Colt's patent firearms manufacturing company and their famed single action revolvers. Most notably, well, this guy. We want to make sure you recognize the Colt 1873, nicknamed the Peacemaker. These were single action six shot gate loaders adopted and beloved by the US Army. Now the 73 was a robust, reliable centerfire revolver, and those features alone would make it popular, but a lot of the enthusiasm was also for the cartridge introduced with this gun. That's gonna be the 45 Long Colt, a black powder centerfire metallic cased with a bullet that was fat, slow, and hit like a hammer. It was an instant success and has remained in production, albeit now in smokeless loadings, to this day. So yeah, the 1873 went over well with military and civilian alike. It was a huge seller, but as fans of the show know that by the time that this gun's releasing, there's other more advanced revolvers starting to appear in Europe. Double action revolvers, fast shooting and reliable. So Colt would have to eventually respond. In 1877, they had released their first production double action design, and this would over time be expanded to include three cartridges, the 32, 38, and 41, resulting in the nicknames Rainmaker, Lightning, and Thunderer. There would also be a larger framed, larger bore 1878 model known as the Frontier or the Omnipotent. More on this guy in a bit. While these guns were at least double and single action, they were still fairly primitive and fragile. With the 1873 still very popular in the US military, contracts were not initially forthcoming for these designs, but they were an important first step. By the way, they did come from the brain of one William Mason, who would continue to make improvements until his departure from Colt in 1882. We tend to recognize him for his later work with John Browning. Mason's work was taken over by the man who had been assisting him, Carl J. Ebbets, who was born in May of 1845 in his native Germany. He attended the Jessen Polytechnic Institute in Hamburg and was a machinist apprentice there starting in 1861. From 1864 to 1867, he furthered his apprenticeship at the Krupp Works while studying mechanical engineering at Karlsruhe. Ebbets would move to the United States in 1868 and serve as a mechanical engineer on the Gatling guns. Starting in 1883, he became the patent agent for Colt. Now, Ebbets liked the idea of a tip-out simultaneous ejecting cylinder, and we can see that here in an 1884 patent that is actually referenced on our revolver today. Yeah, these big guns had 1884 patent claims on them, which is weird because the actual mechanism they used dates from 1888, again patented by Ebbets. This is exactly our swing out cylinder and simultaneous extraction system. I'm not sure why they listed 84 instead of 88 to be honest, it's a bit of a mystery. That particular system along with a lock work of Ebbets design, we'll say Ebbets because clearly it's a copy of a Shamlow Delvine lock work, but it would become the Colt model 1889 which started a small family of incremental model improvements all under the name New Army or New Navy depending. There is a lot of nuance in this series of revolvers and I highly recommend our previous episode if you'd really like to understand them. For today, however, they're another stepping stone, one that introduces a number of unique features and expectations to the US services. Uh, this one that I happen to have here is a little ratty around the edges, but it'll do for a quick peek. So let's take a closer look. 
All right, first and foremost, this is a solid frame revolver that adds a lot of strength. I know a lot of you guys like top brakes, but without this, really, they, they wear through a lot faster. They fire fewer thousands of rounds. Timing on an armorer's level becomes more and more common of a thing that you have to do. Parts, breakages, yada, yada, yada. So this is a big deal. Now, we still have the rapidity of a top brake revolver because we have this handy latch right here. So I pop that open, she slides out, and we have our simultaneous eject. Now, other than that, this gun does introduce some new things to the US Army, which is single, which they already had, and double action, making this what you'd call a triple action gun. It's a medium frame to my hand, very narrow, feels very comfortable, and of course, this is using a small bore smokeless 38 cartridge, which was also new for the US. That new cartridge was pretty advanced, but much less threatening looking than the previous 45 Long Colt. It would prove to be controversial. So as you can tell, the new Colt was a big departure from the 73. Small, light, uh, lighter cartridge. This gun is almost European in its sensibilities. It was basically civilized. I'm not sure how Americans ever honestly tolerated it. Colt did attempt a scaled up version capable of chambering a 40 caliber or larger cartridge. It was meant to compete in the US trial centered on the cavalry who were still distrustful of the 38 more so than others, but this particular variant never got out of prototyping. The US was committed to a modern small bore smokeless revolver apparently, sadly one with a glaring Achilles heel. Basically the cylinder rotates to the left, but the crane closes to the right. This means that every pull of the trigger slowly works against the timing of the gun, leading to inaccurate fire and eventually shaved bullets. That would ultimately doom the new army and led down a road of improvements from Colt. The biggest fix was realized shortly after the first new armies were adopted and it was ready for market in 1893, but institutional momentum had taken over that whole process. Commercially, however, they did have a solution. This was the Colt New Pocket, a diminutive little gun chambered in 32 long or short that was meant to avoid initial competition with the larger 38 New Army. It was followed up by a mid-frame gun in 1896, also in 32 long, known as the New Police, which again avoided cannibalizing the existing New Army. I'll forgive you for thinking that these are just new army actions flipped to the other side, but they're actually not. This patent, oddly filed rather late, has most of the major features of the new action, and curiously, has a name other than Ebbets present. James Johnson Purd was born in New York City in 1849, though he'd moved quickly to Hartford, Connecticut, where he attended public school before joining Colt. There he learned the machinist trade before going to the Providence Tool Company in 1873 and Remington in 1876, where he remained until sometime around 1881, when he'd rejoin Colt, rising to assistant superintendent in 1888. Purd is our most likely originator for the new new action, the stronger action, the simpler action, one that is clearly a minor evolution of the Galan de Guerre. Take a look, the big differences are the hammer rebound has been built into the combination hand and trigger spring, and the cylinder stop is on a separate arm. Man, everything goes back to Galand or Warnant when it comes to revolvers. But let's get back to the year 1898 when we have two guns that we need to be concerned with the new army and the new police. The former has more complex internal action and suffers from a deterioration on accuracy over time thanks to the hand pressing against the crane. The latter has a cleaner, stronger action, but only chambers up to a 32 caliber to avoid competing with the former. The Americans in the audience can see the obvious market gap. Colt does not have a 40 plus caliber gun available for the last two big innovations in their technology. And that's a problem, especially because the army has had a heck of a time actually settling into their new revolver. Many soldiers just are not happy about this little 328 caliber, they don't trust it. Even if the US government stayed with 38, Colt knew that there was still a market for big bore handguns. Plenty of Americans were still fans of 45 Long Colt. And, other markets, like those in the UK, were still very happily using 455, so Ebbets and Purd scaled up their design, and that's really about it. They just made the thing bigger. Keeping with the naming convention, this became the Colt New Service Revolver. Can you tell that they wanted military contracts? For the most part, that leads us up to our gun today, but before we look closer, I have to skip a bit ahead 
in time. In 1905, Colt introduced an automatic hammer block safety into their revolvers. This was designed by engineer George H. Tansley. The additional safety resulted in a marketing name change with the new pocket and new police becoming the pocket positive and the police positive. This same change would be the only major addition to the Colt No Service before the Great War, and strangely, it did not cause the gun to be rebranded like the others to the Service Positive. Instead, the new service kept its original name. All right, with all that covered, let's take a closer look at this gun. Now, this is a military gun, obviously, uh, so I'm getting a little ahead of myself in the fact that this has a very dull service finish. These would have been very bright, high finish blue in the commercial world at this point, but what are we looking at? We're looking at a much larger gun from the previous. I mean, I mean, look at how much that fills up my palm. Very comfortable. I uh, imagine it would sag your right side of your pants a little bit. I mean, it's a hefty boy, but uh, what do we got? We got single, ooh, and double action. Okay, that's the basics. We also have carried over that swing out cylinder and simultaneous ejects. So from this much alone, looking at the outside of the thing, you just think it was a bigger version of the new army. But of course, internally, we have some improvements. So I'm gonna go ahead and go inside of this gun for you. So get my screwdriver aligned and start opening her up. So my grip is going to fight me and I'm trying not to scratch it while also still showing you what I'm doing, but there's only so much I can accomplish. So pop this guy out. Set that aside. Pop this guy out without scratching this beautifully still intact military finish. And pop this guy out up here. And that's it. There's really only two screws we need to deal with on the frame itself. So bada bing, bada boom. This normally Mark would tell you that we can just sort of tap and it'll work loose. But unfortunately, I think that military finish is kind of binding it. So I'm going to have to give her a gentle, ever so gentle, less than one pound pry. Just, just a little bit. And you may notice this guy moved, that's because he's resting on a spud. So once I have it pried, I can just gently lift it out. There we go. If I flip this over, you'll see there's a hole here that aligns this latch with this. Let me get my patented plastic and pokey. It's tab right here. So that's what actually is our release. So if I were to push back on that, I can open up the cylinder. If I put it back in, uh, a little more forcefully, cylinder is locked shut. So, if we're looking at this, we have a modified Galand action, which means we have a main V spring, we have this rebound lever. This rebound lever, by the way, is pressing that lower spring pressure over to the hand. It's also pushing it up against the rear of the hammer down in there. And that's why it's called the rebound lever, because if you notice, if I fire this thing, let her all the way down, if I let go, that hammer is going to rebound. And that's not the only safety feature in this gun. As a matter of fact, you know, by the way, you guys know how single and double action works now. We've got the nose for double action, single action extension on the hammer, hits an extension on, on the trigger. You'll see it more in the animation. But this block in here is what we care about as a positive safety. So where it's at now, a strong blow from the rear on this hammer will not allow it to go all the way down to the primer on the gun. This is drop safe in its current position. The block only lowers when we pull the trigger. So you can see it coming down, lowers enough to fit into a gap in the hammer so that the hammer can fall all the way down. That's our beautiful positive lock. We've seen that before in our earlier Colt Army special episode. Uh, the other thing to note about this system that I didn't get to mention then is that it actually acts as an out of battery safety. So what happens is, let's say that the cylinder isn't quite closed all the way. If the cylinder isn't quite closed all the way, this spud won't be all the way forward. So I've got it just ever so slightly out of battery right now, okay? If I try to pull the trigger, you notice I'm stuck right here. And that's because, again, linked to the trigger is this safety bar and it is contacting this little spud that's sticking out and I cannot possibly pull that trigger unless this goes all the way in. And of course, with spring tension, that would also go all the way in. The spring, by the way, being on this plate here, 
now the system is running again. So excellent out of battery safety, excellent uh, rebound safety, excellent hammer block. This is a very good military system. You know, the best designs in firearms technology seem ridiculously simple from the outside. They're so easy to use that everything is absolutely obvious, but that doesn't mean that that's what's going on inside. I often hear people say revolvers are simpler than semi-auto handguns. Let's see if our little x-ray specs can prove that little nugget wrong. To load this up, we'll swing out our cylinder and insert six rounds. Note the lever is connected to a central pin that retains the cylinder right down the middle. We'll start in single action, and you guys are pretty familiar with the system already from our Army Special episode. But notice how the rebound arm, that gray bar at the bottom, presses on the back of the hammer to rebound it after each shot. Cock the hammer until it locks on the trigger extension. Pull the trigger and the gun goes bang. Now we'll switch to double action. A pull the trigger tips the nose, the hammer, and then releases. Now a lot of things are going on behind that hammer, so let's take a look right through it. Here we can see the white linkage that ties in the orange hammer block. In its resting state with the trigger forward, it prevents the hammer from dropping all the way and keeps the gun drop safe. When the trigger is pulled, this retracts and fits into a notch in the hammer when it does. This allows it to intentionally fall. It also serves as an out-of-battery safety. If the cylinder latches back, the block cannot fall, and therefore the trigger cannot be pulled through. Just to show it more clearly, this block is powered through a pivoting transfer bar, straight off the trigger. Unloading is just as simple as loading. Pull the latch, open the cylinder, and depress the plunger sharply. Alright, sorry guys, but I'm back. While the mechanism is covered at this point, we still have no military adoption, so what the heck is this thing doing on our show? Well, right about the time that this gun hit the market, the US would find itself fed up with the new army in 38. But despite their need for a big bore, the new service was, well, too new, and so they'd skip over it at first. Instead, the earliest adopter of this beast would be... Canada. Yep, our apologetic neighbors to the north wanted revolvers pretty badly. You see, the Canadian militia had been making a habit of calling up Colt whenever they were caught flat-footed. Back in the Crimean War, the British found themselves distracted, so Canada was responsible for its own defense, summed up in the Militia Act of 1855. Their first pistol purchases were the then very current Colt Model 1851s, which they held just a little bit too long. Cap and ball was a bit outdated by the time of the indigenous people's Northwest Rebellion of 1885. And so Canada would rush to the Colt double action model of 1878, which was a great improvement, but as we already covered, was a bit of an evolutionary dead end. The 78 would remain standard until the start of the Boer War, when Britain would pressure Canada into sending militia volunteer battalions. This mobilization again created a need for an updated sidearm. The Department of Militia and Defense again called on Colt and found a brand new revolver waiting, purchasing 943 of them over the course of the war, all with 5.5 inch barrels for $15.50 a pop. Ammunition is a bit tricky as my sources vary somewhat. It appears that the very first batch was in 45 long Colt, likely because that's what was available immediately. They soon gave way, however, to guns chambered in 455, specifically the Mark II Cordite powder cartridge, uh, short cased, but again, a big, slow, and heavy hitting cartridge, one that we obviously see staying through World War I and into World War II. The original ammo samples were provided to Colt by the Ellie brothers in London. This, combined with avoiding using a competitor's name, resulted in the 455 Ellie marking on the Colt barrels. Now, if you're wondering why they bought under 1,000 revolvers, there are a few reasons. One, the first contingent already sailed with the Colt 78s, and two, many Canadian-raised units served under the British directly using their equipment, and three, 
not everybody gets issued a handgun. All right, the Colt News Service has its first military role, and opinions are mixed. Some officers love the revolver and found it to be a much improved cavalry pistol, which is true enough, but on the Velt, a handgun really wasn't all that useful, and many of them had been returned to inventory since they were effectively dead weight in a long-range battle. Still, Canada would hold on to the Colts for some time, and in general, the Colt had worked its way into the greater United Kingdom's armed forces. British officers of the era were responsible for their own sidearms, uh, and the standard was the Webley top brake. The Mark IV with a 4-inch barrel and 455 was standard equipment, at least until it was replaced with the near-identical Mark V in 1913. But some preferred the swing-out cylinder Colt with its well, fine action and rugged solid frame. The gun also was generally purchased in five and a half inch barrels and was often believed to be more accurate than the Webley. Since they used the same service ammunition as the Webley, it was a simple matter to just buy a Colt instead. And so despite no official adoption, many of these guys uh, were sold commercially in 455 and were already in British service when war were declared. I think it will be fairly obvious that plenty of these were purchased, and we'll get there in a moment. First, I have to apologize. In trying to script this episode, I found it difficult to tell the story in chronological order because you basically have to watch two hours before we shot a single handgun, and so this would make it for a three or four hour episode overall. I split it up between the British Empire and the US service. The 455s saw combat first, but most of the minor design evolutions come from the US trials. So if you're wondering how these little changes happened, we'll get to them in the next episode, along with one major evolution I'm sure you're very excited for. Regardless, we're here now at the start of the war, and British officers clearly have these in tow. So let's get this one over to May for a demonstration. I don't think I'm giving away too much to say that we're gonna shoot a few more of these variants and have already shot them by the time I'm filming this. This one had the heaviest dang spring out of any of them, but still beautiful, very, very fine. So where were we in terms of history? Let's see. Oh, uh, previously we've covered the story of the Webley revolvers in British service, but I'd like to point out a couple things in the context of the Colt. The Webley Mark V had been standard at the time of the Great War, and the manufacturer had struggled to increase production. On top of that, the British made further changes to the gun during the war, resulting in the Mark VI, which released in the middle of 1915. Taking a look at this gun with its longer barrel and improved grip, I'm gonna bet that the Colt's handling was having an influence on Webley. Like I said, Webley was struggling to keep up with production demands, just like everyone else in Europe, really. So the British War Office would reach out to Colt for additional handguns. The first known contract was for 5,000 units in September of 1914, but it wouldn't receive an official service designation all the way until July of 1915. Now known as the pistol Colt 455 inch with five and one half inch barrel Mark One. British demand meant that every part available was put to work. So some World War I era new service Colts and 455 have a mixture of early and late features. Again, more on those features 
in our next episode. Bluing was initially the fine commercial deep and polished finish, but this would give way to more expedient lighter coatings, and sometimes you'll find these guns with that thick British service paint that would be a post-war refurbishment. By the way, these guns are compatible with the British Rapid Prideaux Loader, which could be used on Webley and Colt alike to allow faster replacement of six cartridges in the cylinder. Known contracts total up to 43,000 or so total 455 Colt new services for England, but the edges aren't crisp and it looks like some data has gone missing. We do know Colt estimated production capacity to 100,000 in the initial bid, so the likely answer is somewhere in between. The last known contract was signed November of 1916, which fits with other data we have for the Smith & Wesson and Spanish 455 contracts. During the same period, Webley production had finally caught up, and so the substitute standard guns were no longer being purchased. Following the war, most of these guns were surplused right away, and plenty were sold over to American commercial markets, where importers rechambered them for 45 long colt because that was much more commonly available in America. This makes them easier to shoot, but less collectible today. The modification can be hard to spot, so let me show you what to look for. Alright, so generally if you're looking at one of these and you want to know if it was shaved, if you're really good at eyeballing them, you'll be able to tell by this gap here. Uh, unfortunately, that's not always easy. So, uh, what do they do when they shave one of these guns? And that's what's called shaving. It's just they take off the back of the cylinder enough to get the 45 long Colt settled in there, lined up, and that's how she runs. So, uh, they have to remove material from the rear. If you notice, one of your first tells is the cylinder stop. The cylinder stop is set so far to the rear that there's basically like a, not a full centimeter to the back. So, if your cylinder rear wall is right up on top of that particular cylinder stop, or any of them really, um, I mean really less than a millimeter, that means it's been shaved. Uh, if you can't spot that in a heartbeat, the other way to sort of tell quickly by feel alone is this stop right here. So this guy is 90 degree angle here, soft from that side. That guy is designed that when we open this up, the cylinder does not knock to the rear by very much. You notice I've got a little bit of play in here. It's about half of a millimeter. If we look at the front, right in that little gap, I mean, it's it's barely anything. There's a lot of rattling because it's a big part and there's some twisting, but it really is half a mil at most. It's very small. If you can get a full millimeter, a centimeter out of this, you've got a shaved cylinder. But uh, at the rear is what you're looking for because this will still be set for 455, and then uh, when this thing was shortened, you'll get a nice big rattle. And as a matter of fact, a lot of these can be difficult to close because if you have the gun angled up, which I can't really do, but if you have the gun angled up and this is set back and you try to close it, uh, these little um, tabs for the hand will actually catch on the recoil shield extension and therefore uh, keep the gun from closing very smoothly. You have to shove the cylinder forward in order to close it. Some of you that have dealt with those guns know what that feeling is. So that's a couple tricks for being able to spot one of these in the wild. Uh, the dead tell, of course, is whether or not there's still serial numbers or British markings on the back of the cylinder itself. You'll see some pennants and things on here. Those will be ground off if this thing's been shortened up. So if it's blank and especially unblued, like silver on the back, yeah, it's probably been shaved down. Now, curiously, just a few months after discharging these guns, British officials realized that they actually did want a better reserve of revolvers in 455. This was mostly from interactions with the Russian Civil War and fears that it would cascade into another European conflict. So they actually offered to buy up privately owned officers, Webley's, Colts, and Smith & Wesson's. Uh, we'll see more on that last gun uh, in a couple episodes. The Spanish top brakes, they were good without those. You can keep those. Uh, these guns and others would come in handy for the Second Great War II, um, well, the Second Great War as well. Uh, in July of 1940, Winchester Repeating Arms, acting as an agent for the British government, put in orders with Colt to purchase all available handguns suitable for military use. And so every new service that was there was gathered up, at least 1,500 of them, and they could be chambered in whatever. They didn't care. This included target models. Uh, they weren't reissued to the front lines, though. Instead, they served with the Home Guard in a reserve role. As for further non-military sales, well, commercially the 455 new service basically came to a halt post-World War I. British gun control efforts really suppressed 
that commercial market. Uh, but they did see continued contracts in Canada, namely to the Northwest Mounted Police. They started using the Colt in 1904 with an initial order of 700 and 455. This was completed by 1906. These are marked on the back strap and WMP for the Northwest Mounted Police. A second order came through in September of 1914, likely due uh, to freeing up spare 455, you know, Webleys and stuff for military service. It totaled perhaps 300 units. These guns are fancier, marked R and WMP for the Royal Northwest Mounted Police. Following orders are a bit spotty, but they were marked RCMP for the name change to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, many of which are actually chambered in 45 Long Colt, which the Mounties ended up switching to for reasons I have not discovered. To avoid confusion with the 455s, the 45s were used in the West and the 455s were used in the East of the country. Overall 1,400 455s and 1,795 45s were acquired until being replaced by the Smith & Wesson Model 10 in 1954. Ooh, okay. So the story of the new service in 455 is basically covered. Uh, there's not a lot of service notes, not a lot of people talking about what is a second standard gun in an act of war. They just sort of say my revolver, so we never know whether it's a Webley or a Colt, but they seem to have done very well. Now, what about our inventors? Carl Ebbets actually dug further into his patent role, speaking six languages. He built a massive patent research library for Colt and handled all of John Browning's designs with the firm, making sure to lock down the most profitable vectors possible. He would remain in Hartford, Connecticut until his death in July of 1925. James J. Purd would become superintendent for Colt in 1902 and was a big part of the run up to their famed automatic pistol. In 1911, he would finally retire due to poor health, passing away in July of 1917. All right, we've covered the history and we've shot the thing, so I guess it's time to get May's opinion on this big, big wheel gun. All right, once more, we've made room for May, and in this 10 by 10 room that we managed to film out of, we've got just enough space for what is probably uh, half the length of the room in revolver form. I exaggerate, but I'm gonna tell you, these guys feel much bigger than they look. I mean, it's not as big as the Gosser, but it, it's just steel all the way through. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's, it, it is surprising on how, how heavy and how big these guys are when you get them in your hands. They don't look so bad in yours though. You do kind of yeah, make, it, make seem... it look a little normal. But anyway, these are big bore revolvers and we're starting with the Colt, but obviously as you guys are probably aware, we're going to continue on into this in other chamberings and then we're going to talk about the Smith and Wesson soon. So May shot all those. And so she's got a little bit of experience that we're not revealing on camera yet. And as part of that, we want to make sure we clarify something about this particular gun before we go any further, which is that out of all the Colts we fired from this frame, this has the heaviest hammer. This is... That was surprising. So I would argue that it's it's probably almost, if not on par with a gasser in terms of how heavy that hammer is. Although, that being said, this one was easier to manipulate just because intrinsically it's more natural. Like it's a more natural shape that's easier for you to hook with your thumb than the gasser hammer. Yeah, you know what, as a matter of fact, why don't we just kick over to ergonomics. So just keep in mind when you look at the old footage, this thing is heavier than the standard. Uh, we'll have others in the next coming episodes so that you can really see what it's like. But I think that's done a, a job of revealing sort of where this gun is more efficient than others or smoother than others. So let me get this in your hands and why don't you just tell people what it was like shooting that particular revolver. When I first handed this gun, I really am looking at it thinking, oh, it's not gonna be that bad. It's not gonna be that big or that heavy because I'm, I'm seeing Othias's big hands coming at me with it. And then no, yeah, it's it's got a lot of weight to it. It's got a lot of length to it. And I'm thinking it's gonna feel uncomfortable yeah, no, surprisingly not. I will say that you feel that weight, but you feel it, I don't know, it does. It kind of rests right here on the top of your knuckle a good bit. And I would say this grip is honestly a big plus for these guns. It really helps you with that weight management. It positions your hand just far enough forward that you feel like you're not, ha like not a lot of it's tipping forward on you. And the flare down here at the bottom of the grip, it's well positioned so that it's right there 
where almost the bottom of my hand fits. And I don't know about anyone else that's shooting these, but that is a well-positioned flare. And it's, it's just the right length, I would say as well. And the swoop fits so naturally into the palm of your hand. It's really comfortable. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, I'm gonna say a well-designed grip will do two things for you. One, help control with recoil and balance and things like that. But two, and a lot of people don't think about this, it makes a very natural pointer. You don't have to think, you just point, and then you're in alignment. And I say that arguably the Colt does a beautiful job at this, at this stage in its development life. Like this is one of the better grip revolvers we've handled, especially since we've had a lot of strange European designs that have come our way. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just wanted to point out why you were sort of thinking so much about the grip. How's it go handling the rest of the gun though? So I will say uh, one of the things about Colts in general it is something that I've noticed that isn't quite natural and that's opening the cylinder because for me, it's a little more natural to push as opposed to pull towards me. And, and don't get me wrong, it's, it's something that you can do and you can do it easily and you can get to being fast at it. But the problem is, is that it's not a natural thing to pull towards your body. I kind of feel like I need to get myself a little bit out of position in order to actually manipulate it. So that's my one, I guess, gripe about Colts in general is that that's never been a natural sensation for me. Right, so unload to unload and reload the gun, you would say that you'd have to unsettle your shooting grip, get the ammo in there, resettle into your shooting grip. Right, exactly. Basically, I have to shift my grip up just a little bit in order to actually be able to wrap my thumb around this little shelf right here with part of that lever. So it, it is just a little bit... Some, it's just not very natural, like I said. Um, but I will say I do appreciate plunger style ejects. Like this this thing is very easy to be able to pop rounds in and pop them out pretty quickly. That I absolutely loved. Um, single action versus double action on this one. Like we said, the hammer is heavy, but all very smooth. We didn't mention that was that it is actually incredibly smooth. The, he the weight, it, it's not as noticeable when, when it becomes that smooth of an action that you can proceed with it. Yeah, we were saying before the show that this felt about as heavy as the Nagano Revolver, and yet the Nagano Revolver had a hump in it, like a, a noticeable trough in it. So you get up on that trigger, and you hit that, that on it. It's not so much that it's heavy, it's that it changes weight, because you hit a point at which you then have to flex a little bit harder, and that change is what really gets you off target. Whereas this one, even though, yes, there's some shaking, yes, there's some like trying to bear down on it, since there's no change in the pull weight the entire way through until all of a sudden it goes off, well, all you have to do is apply the same amount of compensation to your grip, and yes, you will have an accurate shot. So heavy is a problem, don't get me wrong, but it's not as bad a problem if you have completely smooth linear pressure through your pull, which I think Colt does very well. I would absolutely agree. But um, yeah, ergonomics, I don't want to get into the shooting part just yet by accidentally talking too far into that. But overall, it's big, it's heavy. You think it's going to be a bit awkward in especially my smaller hands. Surprisingly not bad. Now, how would you feel about this on your belt, though? Uh, I feel like this might pull my pants down. <laughs> that might be my one, that might be my one concern is that I feel like I need to have a, a stronger belt. And they typically don't make belts that strong. You just get like one suspender just for your big iron yeah, side? Yeah, like that will go off really well. Why do you have a single suspender on one side, May? Uh, well... It's a fashion statement. I feel like statement. if they saw that hang that hanging off your waist, they'd know why you had one suspender on. Well, I mean, oh, okay, I'm not concealing it. It is yeah, out in the open. Yeah, it's a little, are you conceal carrying that? I mean, I'm assuming that's what we're going for. Like, am I in a skirt or something? I, you know. I could conceal it in a skirt. No, Female. okay. Female. So, uh, I don't want to see you trying to get the thing out. So, what about shooting it? So, we've got this big bullet, although slower speed. What does that ultimately equal in net effect? Like how how hard is it to shoot and control this particular gun? You know, being a revolver, you just, and you know it's gonna rock. There's gonna always be rock with revolver. You can't not have one without the other, rock and roll. However, that being said, the sights on these are really tall. They're surprisingly tall for a revolver of that time. So for me, that really helped to speed up that reset time. Don't get me wrong, there's always gonna be a delay in that, but yeah, tall sights are definitely gonna be a pro with that, I'd say. Um, but yeah, other than that, I thought the recoil was manageable. I think it's just something that you have to 
be aware that you're going to have a good bit of a, a pushback with that. Yeah, it's like a rhythm. Uh, you can shove the revolver back down. People get into hook grips and stuff like that. But realistically, at this time, it was one of those things where it's like you let the barrel holder down and contain some of the recoil and you just let your wrist relax back into position and you pull the trigger again when you get to pull the trigger is sort of the thought process of the time. Now, of course, we know semi-auto pistols get rid of this. People start really getting into reset time and back on target and things like that. And automatic handguns do a much better job than revolvers at that because they're able to keep more of their mass to the rear. But as this goes, how do you feel compared to other revolvers? Because we've dealt with other big bore revolvers out of Europe and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's true. We really have. Um, to be honest, though, I will say it's not as bad as you think. I mean, it really isn't. Don't get me wrong. There's a good bit of rock with it, but I feel like the weight with this one and that grip that really helped to mitigate some of that. So I'm going to say this was probably n not one of the worst ones I've handled thus far. Yeah. And to be fair, we're kind of unfairly trying to compare to a lot of different guns. I mean, if you think about what's in the war at that point that we've already covered, it's all over the place. And then the most natural thing is to compare this to a Smith & Wesson. But realistically, the people who were buying these at this point in the story... Will want to compare it to a Webley. That's right. They're they're British. So they're going to be either given like a Webley Mark 4, 5 or a Webley Mark 6. So the Webley Mark 6 is probably the most comparable to this one because it's borrowed elements of it. So look what I have here. Um, we have your full grip with the knuckle. Uh, we have the longer barrel. So these two are getting pretty comparable in terms of their abilities ballistically and grip wise. But the big differences are the top brake uh, and the swing out cylinder, and then also just the actions themselves. So between these two, what are your feelings here? So let's let's isolate for a moment. Just in terms of lock work, try that out, single and double. Okay. And again, people yeah. unloaded. So yeah, single, smooth but heavy, or double, sorry, and then single. God, that's so light. That's amazing. It yeah. truly is. By the way, don't go around dry firing for no reason, but yeah, no, don't. on rare occasion. Okay. Smooth. Not as heavy, but it's not as smooth. Um, I will say that it you can feel it's slightly creakier, but I will say not as heavy for either the single or the double, but the hammer on this one is just Distinctly worse. Yeah, sharper, <laughs> that upwards angle. Now I've noticed most of the guns I've handled um, from the Colt line are about the same weight of trigger pull and hammer pull as a Webley. Mm -hmm. So let's discount the weight aspect of it. To me, this just feels a little lighter in not, not in terms of weight, but the action itself just feels not as solidly there the interactions feel a little bit looser although yeah it not doesn't bad. it feels like there's less like i don't know it feels like it could um, there's a little bit grainier maybe. and on all the all the webleys to me on single action when you actually pull the trigger off of a single action i feel like there's a slight cliff like a slight burr feeling almost but it's just there in all yeah. of them that one is just it's just glass oh. it's just glass all the way through it's amazing now in terms of top break versus swing out now, I will say top break inherently, it, the action itself for opening that, way more intrinsically natural for me as a person because I'm pushing it away from my body as opposed to having to pull it to. I can keep my same grip. So that in and of itself is wonderful. However, that being said, unfortunately, gravity is not really going to help me in this situation if it fails to eject one of the cartridges. Granted, it's auto ejecting. I don't have to manipulate it. Cool. Problem is, is that what if a round gets stuck under the ejector? Which does happen. We've had it happen plenty. Right. And gravity is not really going to help me with that one, whereas opposed to the Colt, I can use gravity to my benefit to pop my rounds out. Yeah, so the game with the Webley is if you goof an extraction, something slips up under there, you got to play this game of going back and forth and trying to get it out and then like getting your thumb under there. It, there's no way to positively grab the ejector system unless you sort of get your finger up under there and get scratched up like I'm doing now. With the Colt, the plunger's there. Now, it's not right. automatic. you got to do it every time. But to me, I've just had so few problems ejecting from a swing out cylinder because the natural path on a swing out cylinder is to turn it over like this, tip it up, pop it. On a top brake, people want to snap it this way at best, which is still pretty, like, honestly, you should probably be doing this to the side. 
or out to this side because that's really going to kick them out of the cylinder a lot better not have them fall back into the path of the cylinder but I, when done perfectly the the webley is faster right when there's an error that's way easier to get yourself out of trouble exactly and that's that's just the difference between the two realistically what it boils down to and if you had to pick between the two well obviously the colt you think so yeah honestly because this one just it's naturally going to have a, a longer longe uh, longevity longevity thank you i was trying to think of the word and breaking up on it because unfortunately top brakes are inherently not as sturdy. oh are you suggesting the top brakes aren't as good as top straps god there are gonna be so many there comments so many comments <laughs> Which is absolutely true though. We've not had a single Webley come through our hands, and we're talking like five or six at this point, that did not need to be retimed because they get out of whack. Like they just, they deform. It's just the nature of the beast. I don't think we've had to retime a single one of these Colts unless it had, nope. I mean, I guess Mark maybe has had to do a couple timings on Colts that have been shot you know, hundreds of thousands of times, but you know, 100 years later on the Webley, even just being played around with by people sort of testing it out like this and slamming it around, they start to get out of whack and they oh, yeah. have to be reshaped and tightened down. I'm sorry guys, top brakes are inherently weaker. They just are. I know it hurts your feelings and you really want it to be a modern commercial top brake. I do too, it sounds cool. They're not nearly as strong. So I would agree with May, the Colt is better than the Webley. So that leaves us to your question, would you take it into battle? You know, I can't really think of a reason to say no. This has been a fantastic revolver, and I'd probably argue that it's been the best revolver we have handled for the series so far. The action is smooth, while granted the hammer heavy, still also intrinsically natural for me to operate. The grip was fantastic, the cartridge is decent, and don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not a super big fan on having to pull open a tab to access the action, but I can eject the rounds quickly, pop them in pretty easily. The sights were fairly tall, tall in general for any pistol or revolver for their time. So yeah, honestly, I can't th really think of a reason to say no to a Colt. This is a pretty fantastic revolver and I had a fun time with it and it was deadly accurate with it too. This is one of those cases where the second standard item might be better than the original. I'm not, by the way, Webleys are great. Oh, yeah. We said yes to the Webley, I believe. But it's better. Like, in my mind, I have more faith in that. And again, we're not, we're not like the super American exceptionalist group. It's just that American firearms technology was really good at this time. And this exemplifies that. This is the best of what we took out of the cowboy era. You know what I mean? And it, I enjoy it. I feel comfortable with it. I would bet my life on it. I've had never had one not go bang. Um, they're just they're they're good guns. Now, you said that you think it might be the best revolver that we've done in the series to date, and I'm gonna have to challenge you on that because we have shot the Colt Army Special already, which was the smaller 38 Special that was used by oh, Greece. Yeah, it has been a while, hasn't yeah. it? And Greece is one of those weird cases where they had like probably the best revolver because they got that small contract of Army Specials, and they had the one of the best bolt actions because they had the Schoenauers. They couldn't afford either. Like it's just an insane decision because numerically they never had enough of either of those things, but. They were pretty sweet when they had them. If you're the one guy that managed to get like a Monlicker Schoenauer carbine and a, a Colt, you know, Army Special Revolver, good on you, man. Sucks for everybody else in your army though, that were carrying around Graw. But um, this oh, is no. up there. They were carrying Graw. Yeah. But this is, I mean, in terms of revolvers, I'd say top five for the war easily. I would definitely say top five. Yeah, on, I, I probably shouldn't say top yet so far because I feel like... Soon we're gonna have some more showing <laughs> up potentially. I mean, it's a toss up. I don't know what's gonna come along? Now, that but... being said, would you necessarily choose that over um, a good automatic handgun? Not even a great one, just a good one. I think it depends. Um, cartridge for that time was a big seller, I would say. So, like, unfortunately, a lot of those automatic handguns came in thirty-two. Uh, 32 is kind of a big bump down for some of them and then also well you know on top of that they would just carry more rounds sometimes which was beneficial or um, you'd have something like the savage that would carry 10 rounds of 32 that's pretty cool i still might prefer six rounds of 455 but what if we get into a game where you're talking about like a steyr han or an fn 19 or 3 and 9 millimeter browning 
Like the Sarahan's an awkward one though, because that one's stripper cup loading right there. So that one's not a fast load. No, but that's not particularly fast either. No, it's true, it's not. And then unfortunately only six rounds with this one, so I gotta mmm. I'd probably go with Styrahan. Yeah, I'd probably yeah, I would go with the Styrahan. I would go with a pretty decent automatic as a or semi-automatic as opposed to a revolver i would say if yeah. i had the choice between the two i mean granted if this is my option i'm not going to be sad about it yeah. now i won't but the, if i'm given the option between the two well i'd probably go for the semi-auto and then the final advantage over the semi is at this time not nowadays nowadays ammo is tight okay but at that time this is not ammunition dependent so if you had a bad batch of wartime ammo this would keep firing Whereas the semi-automatic, you'd have to start clearing jams. So there is that element too. You're a little bit more of wartime slop proof with something like this. This is true. Okay, so we've talked about Britain's adoption of the 455 Colt new service. Um, next time we're going to talk more about the new service and how it served with the United States. So uh, if you'd like to know anything more about this sort of uh, meta of the show, we're going to have updates after the credits. But otherwise, have a good one. Bye, guys. All right, gang, uh, that wraps up episode 101. Uh, that's going to be one of four for a sort of micro series. It was easier to develop these all together since the research kind of overlapped and it let me tell the story the best way possible. So uh, those of you who like wheel guns, you're going to be very happy. Uh, for those of you who don't, I'm sorry, but I promise something very interesting as the next one after the revolver episode. It's just so much nicer to get all that information in together. Now, where we're at with the show... Well, currently, we are in a t-shirt campaign, and by the time you're watching this, we may have triple funded, so you may have seen another Crozier video, but uh, as a little time capsule, we're doing our first limited run t-shirt, so uh, these are the 2019 summer shirts that'll be available, 2019 summer campaign, and then never again, so that's great. Uh, and then on top of that, we've been releasing little mini videos with Crozier this time where May and I have actually tried to reenact some movie scenes. So uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying that. We're really trying to find a way to say thank you in a meaningful way instead of just the platitudes. We're actually putting in a little bit of elbow grease and humor so that you guys know that we appreciate what you're doing for the show. So we've only made it this far thanks to all of you and we're only going to make it beyond thanks to all of you. So as always if you're watching thank you. If you're supporting on Patreon double thank you. If you're contacting me with resources or loaner guns or things like that thank you thank you thank you. We appreciate it all very much. All right have a good one.